Good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, just to say, next week we have a guy called Philip Greer who's coming to talk about st uh, a stuff or a material called concrete canvas. So you're all very welcome um, next week. Um, I'd like you to. I'd like to introduce you to Tim McFarlane, um, who's a structural engineer, um, and welcoming welcome him back after I've worked out eight years. Oh. The last time in here, but. Um, so I'm sorry about that. It wasn't the lecture was very good well, last it's, it's time. The same, right? It's the same lecture. I hope it's different. No, students, no, different yeah. students. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, Tim's an engineer who's uh, he's fundamentally changed. This is not a long introduction, so don't don't worry. Uh, he's fundamentally changed uh, the way we think about glass um, and its use as a structural material. Um, my father would say it's because he's Scottish, but um, which might be true. Um, but it, I think Tim's skill is working with, with some of the world's kind of great uh, designers and architects um, is a kind of an intuitive understanding of, of structure and material and then making it work. So thanks very much for coming back, Tim. Thanks very much, Will. Um, yeah, it was, it was eight years ago, and it is the same lecture. Um, <laughs> I, I keep adding wee bits on the end and taking wee bits off the front. And the reason is that it's... Um, it's actually quite an important part of my um, development um, as an engineer, for sure. Um, and, and certainly in terms of understanding uh, what it is we all do, really, which is a funny thing to say because you think after a long time doing what you do, like I've been doing, um, you should really have, have known a little bit earlier. But um, you kind of get dumped into it, you know. You sort of come out as a graduate and someone gives you a big pile of books and says, get on with it. And what you imagine is that all the knowledge that you need is in these books. It is, isn't it? You know, it's all been codified. Everyone's actually already worked it all out and all you need to do is to apply it. Um, that is actually the case, you know, that's what happens. And I, I remember thinking, I wonder if I'll ever get to design something. You know, it felt to me designing something had something to do with thinking about something fresh. Okay? Fairly simple. And I thought, I, you know, one day I'm going to know enough so I can think about something fresh was my uh, basic thought. And I think if I'd never encountered uh, two architects in particular in London, Eva Jurikna and uh, Rick Mather, I'd probably still be wondering what, what it is I do. Um, or at least not experiencing what you kind of think, you know, you read about engineering in the 19th century and you think, cranky, they had great fun, you know. They were really doing dramatic, interesting things and they were heroes, you know, they were kind of national heroes. Um, whereas it's quite hard to find uh, national structural engineering heroes. You know, we know them, we've got them, but they're, they're, they're not so uh, um, prominent. And I, and I think there's probably a reason for that, which has is, is got a lot to do with what we make things with and what we get involved with. And as engineers, we generally get involved with steel, common, with glass, with uh, concrete. And they're the most uh, normal things that we would deal with. So, someone would want us to help them with that. Now, you have to think, well, where did that all start? Where did we get involved with you guys? I mean, you guys being architects, we guys being engineers. When did that happen? Why did that happen? really, because we, we, we're different from you, okay? We, we think differently. We think in a very focal way, you think in a very broad way. We think you think that way, anyway. <laughs> and the, 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 um, the reason that we actually got together is quite interesting because, you know, you, you, I think you were quite happily building fairly large stone edifices and um, making things with materials which craftsmen understood, which you understood because the progress was probably fairly slow. Brick on brick is brick on brick is brick on brick. That's how it works. You know, it can be this size or that size, and so you kind of built a few that fell down, and then you decided not to build them in the same way the second time. So the progress was very slow. And somehow at the end of the 19th century, um, steel and concrete started to emerge as materials which you were kind of looking at and thinking, blimey, that looks interesting, you know. When you suddenly see Crystal Palace or you see station structures going up and you're starting to think, hmm, 
you know, I wonder. I mean, I think Ruskin was thinking something else, but, you know, mostly uh, ambitious uh, architects who wanted to push the boundaries were kind of thinking steel and concrete might be the future. Uh, so, what did you do? Well, who was making the steel and concrete? Well, it was the engineers. That's what we did. We were in there with our hands making stuff, right? Designing and making. And being good engineers, like Henry Ford would agree, we made one and then decided to repeat it 3,000 times so that we could get a great bottom line profit so we know exactly how to make it and so it would be exactly, it would always stand up. Right? So that was the same with steel and with concrete. And you guys were looking at it and you were saying, hmm. So you went along to these guys and you said, look, you know, we'd, we'd quite like uh, to work with that or that material. And so we, the engineers, said, well, which one do you want? Do you want that one or that one? Of course, being architects, you said, no, 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 I want this one. And we said, well, we don't do that one, you know. That's not one we do. We do this one or this one. There's a dialogue needed somewhere. They make stuff, you design stuff. Right? It's very important. It's very important when you finally discover that this was a process. They make stuff, you design stuff, and it's fundamentally different. When I'm making stuff, what I want to do is I want to make it as efficiently as I can, as simply as I can, and as profitably as I can. That's my goal when I make stuff. And you as designers, you definitely don't want to do the thing that was made last time. You want to make a new thing. Funny thing about architecture is about architecture is that it's always unique. Right? You don't say, oh, we'll do another one of them there, do you? Mm. Even if you were asked to do another one of them there. In fact, there's a funny story because we're, we're doing some work in um, Azerbaijan, and there's this great kind of building going up there, and I said, no, oh, that, what's that then? He said, oh, that's the, the president's wife saw that thing you did in the Green Giant site south of the Thames, and she wanted one. So she went to the architect and said, um, found out who it was, and said, can we have one of them? So I said, yeah, yeah, great. And she, after about six months, she said, no, you don't get it. I want one of them. So, you know, the idea of doing something twice is, is, is the antithesis in the design process of, you know, when you're making something. When you're making something, what you really have, have, have as, a, as, as, a, as an end game, as a goal, is different. So, back to the engineer, where did he come in and what's it got to do with glass? Okay. The engineer came in because the architects were quite fly. They said they're quite crafty. They, said, they kind of sneaked into the factories and they pulled the engineer aside and said, why don't you take off your dirty old shawls and put on a suit and tie and come and sit with us? And, you know, we'll pay you a little bit of money. That was right. Um, and you can help. Um, instead of being in the production process, you can be in the design process. Right? So you brought the engineer out of the industry, you stuck him in your design office, and you came up with an idea. So you said, well, I want to do this. So the engineer scratched his head and said, well, I know how they make that, and, you know, and I kind of know how that could work. Oh, I know, we could, get them, we could get them to do that. So by the time you go to get the thing that you want, you then are very clear. In other words, you're very specific about what you want, right? You don't say, I want roughly this. You say, I want exactly that. Please build it like that. Now, but now, the contractor says, well, I'm going to charge you such and such. So that's fine. Just make it like that. The reason he wouldn't do that before is because there's design risk. He's not going to take the engineering risk of making something that he doesn't know how it works, OK? And most of the things he was making, he would experiment with check out that they worked. The theory wasn't that developed. The French were very good with theory, so they gave us all their books, and then we started designing. So we could actually design without making. We could design without experimenting. And we could ask the fabricator to make it, and he would. And so we got drawn into your team. 
now what happened was that we decided that there was lots of people being drawn into these teams, so we'd better regulate them and make sure they don't get out of hands, right? So we started to write books, codes of practice, and we started to tell them exactly how to make a steel and exactly how to make a concrete structure. And that's how you do it. If you look at the early concrete stuff that was done in the 20s and 30s, there's a much wider spectrum than you have now. It's interesting. I mean, you get, you get really, you know, in, in, in France particularly, there's some wonderful examples of, you look, it looks like stone and you think someone's carved it. That's concrete. I never saw it done like that. So, you know, you get in the beginning, you get a very, very wide spectrum and then bureau bureaucracy basically comes in and shuts it down. Okay. So you, now, when I started, there was a little code of practice about this thick. It gave you 10 rules on how to design a concrete beam. I looked at the, the latest euro norm. It's 170 pages for the first document. It refers to another one, which is 220 pages. And then I've got the national index. I'd be about 95 by the time I've actually read it. You know, so you kind of lose, you lose this whole wonderfully kind of hands-on, tactile, working in the design process to actually work up something into something which is entirely coming from your own real understanding of something because you really had to understand it. That's why this is the same show that I always talk about, right? Because this is me learning as an engineer what's possible if you throw away all the books and start with a clean sheet of paper from the beginning, you know? And I, and I think um, it's terrifying. You know, I used to have this wonderful kind of safety net of all these books and all these codes, which, you know, if I've done it in accordance with that, it won't fall down and no one's going to sue me. Suddenly, I had Eva Jurekna saying, could I help her design a glass tread for a glass staircase? I thought, blimey, all I could imagine was someone falling through it, you know, cutting the leg and me going to jail. So I said, no, I don't think I could design a glass staircase even. In fact, I think it's a silly idea because no one's going to walk on it anyway, are they? But being Eva Jurekna, she kept going, she kept going. Um, finally, we kind of timidly stepped into the idea of, well, maybe we should look at it. So we, we did the, the, the one thing that you would do, wouldn't you? I mean, you, you'd call up somebody who knows, wouldn't you? Pilkingtons, there you go. They must know. They're the biggest glass company in the world. Heaven's sakes, I'm going to call them and say, how do you do a glass tread? And it was good because, you know, called them up and they said, yeah, you've got to make it um, 25 millimeters thick, right? It's got to be made of annealed glass, which are not strengthened anyway, just annealed glass. And it got to sit inside a frame of one inch by one inch steel angle. I said, brilliant. So I went to Eva, I said, this is how you do it. You know, you do inch thick. She said, I don't want that steel angle. She doesn't want the steel angle. Oh. Well, she's got to have the steel angle. Well, why has she got to have the steel angle? Uh, because that's the way we do it. Why would you do it that way? Well, that's the way we do it. I said, well, okay. I said, well, I'm an engineer. I said, so could, could you tell me what's the strength of glass? That's a kind of good question, isn't it? Oh, they said, that's a difficult question. What a difficult question. I'm an engineer. I mean, you, surely you can tell me what the strength of glass is. No, no, it's a difficult question. Now, that's very critical too, right? Because you've got to remember, I'm thinking, I'm thinking that everything should be in the public domain. There shouldn't be any secrets, should there? I mean, my, you know, the idea that a company had a secret which gave them a commercial advantage was particularly an engineering secret. It didn't even cross my mind that such a thing could be the case. But of course it's the case, you know. What they have as technical knowledge gives them the advantage to do what they do. It wasn't, it was my first encounter with 
I, I'm at sea, I don't know anything. I actually don't know anything and I can't know anything about this. How am I going to find out? So fortunately, the Americans, um, the quality of the Americans, where you look for their qualities, are, in my mind, a fantastic directness and simplicity. Okay? Any Americans here, I'm sure you'll know what I mean. You know, if you go to Glasgow, you'll feel at home. <laughs> and you say what you mean, and I had this book, which is called Mark's Engineering Handbook, and it's about well, it's 900 pages thick, of all the very thin paper. And it's funny that, you know, it was printed in 1942. And every time I want, you know, what's the strength of granite or something? You know, some strange thing I needed to know, I'd find it. And I thought, I wonder, you know. And I looked it up. And glass, you know, page 742. I look it up. There's two lines, okay? Two lines. But in the two lines, there was the compressive stress, tensile stress, that, that lot. Every single figure and more that I needed to know to design something. Well, sort of. I mean, it gave me the figures, but it didn't tell me how to use them. Okay, it just said they're the breaking strength. Now, having read all these codes, that, you know, breaking strength, well, what do they mean? Ultimate, do they mean whatever? And then I found out that um, it didn't explain it, so I did what any good engineers did, would do, which is that I divided the figure by 10. Okay, so they said 70 you could use, and I decided I would use seven. And so I designed my first structure, glass structure for seven newtons per millimeter squared. Because we need a number as an engineer, we can't work without numbers, okay? And that was the beginning. And it's gone on since then. Um, so, in, in a sense, the code is still not written, and it's wonderful because as so, soon as someone writes, writes the code, you'll get some snotty little building inspector will say, ah, no, 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 it says this here. And you'll say, no, I know, but we don't, we don't use 7 anymore, we use 13 because we've been working with it for 20 years. Oh, no, but it says 7 here. And that's what will happen, you know. So, your ability to use your engineering judgment will be closed down. You know, when the code comes out, oh, all the bureaucrats will jump in and they'll love to apply the numbers that are in there and it'll be like the Bible, you know. It says it here, yeah. The world was born 700 years ago, yeah. <laughs> Who wrote that code? Yeah, someone wrote that code. Some. Um, anyone spot the deliberate mistake? Anyone worried about that at all? Feel happy? That's glass, by the way. Just that, that, that is uh, glass. Any problems with that? Okay, I'll tell you the problem. What happens when it breaks? And that is the main and probably most important singular point about glass at every level. What happens when it breaks? They fall down. Okay. What happens when it breaks? You fall down. What happens when it breaks? How much does it cost to replace it? Can you replace it? There is a company in China who can make you a piece of glass, if you like it, longer than this room. And a single piece, same height as this room, toughened, laminated, and bent. How about that? I don't know how you get it to where you want to get it, but if you could get it there, they can do it. And the other question is, when it breaks, how are you going to get it back? And how are you going to get the other one there? So every time that you design something with glass, its Achilles heel at the moment is that it breaks. It is its nature. Super strong glass, it still breaks. Doesn't matter how strong it is, the nature of the material as it now is made is that it breaks. Okay? So everything you design, you have to think, oh, how are they going to replace that? 
when it breaks. Or my new theory, new idea, that I hope you'll all go out and spread. And I should have really shown an example. If you go into any kind of medieval cathedral and you walk about the floor, okay, big marble slabs or something, big granite slabs, or, what will you find? They're cracked, right. So they're cracked. But why, why don't you replace them? Does anybody want to replace them? Would you care if it was replaced? Does it matter if it's replaced? Does it do anything because it's cracked? So remembering the first thing I said, which is what happens when it breaks? As an engineer, it can't fail. I can't let it fail. So if it breaks, it's got to still be there. In my, my mind, it's still got to be there. I mean, it obviously mustn't let in the water. And if it's that toughened glass, you know the stuff you get in bus shelters and crumbs on the floor, which you can break with a sharp point if you really want to break it. That's not very good, because when that breaks, you've really got to replace it, usually, because visually, you lose it. But you can get a semi-strengthened glass, which cracks like glass glass, you know, <coughs> little crack down the corner. And I bet, I bet most people, if they live in a house that's more than 50 years old, or maybe 100 years old, they've got little panes of glass, there'll be crack in the corner. And you don't replace it, right? You don't rush out and put in a new panel. You don't because it's not fallen out, and you don't because it's not letting in the water. So why, why would you bother? So um, part of my thinking now is to try and encourage people not to worry if it breaks, because that 18 meter long piece of glass is not going anywhere structurally if it gets a crack in it. And as long as you can accept it, you know, the cath cathedral's got a cracked slab on the floor. Why can't my glass window have a glass? It's because we associate it with danger, fear, cutting, all of those things which glass has been. You have lumps of glass sitting up on buildings, which if they break, they fall down and kill you. And that's all over the world. And we kind of accept it because it was the only way it could be done. But it's not now the only way it could be done. You can actually build every single piece of glass you put on a, on, on a building to stay there when it cracks. Stay there completely, not fall into one little piece falling down. So that's a change, okay? That's where we've come to in the last 20 years. And it's all been driven, and this is the really exciting bit, it's all been <coughs> driven by the design process. It has not been driven by production. And someone being clever, I can make another piece of glass which is like that. It's been driven by us being able to say the glass manufacturer, don't worry, we've sorted it. We know how it works, just do it. And they say, great, you gonna pay us? Steve Jobs says, yeah, here's, you know. He's promoted in doing the Apple stores the production of glass, which when we started was six meters long up to the 18 meters. It was him who got the Chinese to invent a machine to do 12 meters, and he thought, 12 meters? Ha, we'll do 18. So, and that's come from design process. It's also come from rich folk like Steve Jobs. So, you know, you also need a good client, I guess, but not always. A good design idea is not necessarily an expensive idea. In fact, I will show you one thing here, which is another illustration Design and really good design should be efficient and economic at every level, in my money, as an engineer. I'm, I've failed somehow if I've not managed to do that. And where's a, there's a coincidence of architectural idea with engineering efficiency. It's really, from my point of view, it's, it's quite interesting to get something and I'm going to show you a design for a wall which is supported by cables, okay? Pretty commonplace now. But when we did our first one, which was about 1998, we did something that hadn't been done, basically. We did a big wall, 30 meters uh, high, semicircle, 60 meter diameter, 30 meters high. 
So we basically, we hung cables from an arch and we tensioned them with a big weight on the bottom. Just <coughs> hung a big weight on the bottom. And then we attached the glass to the cables. And basically what happens is when the wind comes, the cables just, and the weights come up, you know, and the wind drops, and then it relaxes down again. Incredibly simple, but hadn't been done. And big, you know, big mistake, big problem. So this is where I learned, this is where I learned a second thing. You have very good contractors out there who are doing steel and glass. Very good, great contractors. So there was three of them in America, which is where this job was. And we brought them all in and we said, here's what we want to do. And they're all nodding their heads saying, yep, mm -hmm. yeah, that looks, that looks good. So we sent them off and, you know, everything came back. We, we had actually priced our own project. You know, we worked out the cost of cabling, glass, everything. And we worked out it should cost something like $2 million per end, like $4 million. And the contractors came back $5 million per end. Oh, well. Why is it so expensive? Well, number one, none of them came back with our design. Huh? One came back with a, a um, cables in two directions. And instead of weights, they had a 60 meter long steel truss to take the bottom tension from the cables, which because they weren't weighted, were putting variable loads on it. So the arch at the top, instead of being a pure, very simple form, became this deep. Instead of this deep, became this deep. So there was only a wee bit of window left in the middle. You know, it's like the wrong design, isn't it? And then Pilkingtons, who were one of the others, they came back with steel fins, which were this deep. I mean, glass fins, sorry, this deep. Big glass fins, spanning up 30 meters, great big metal junctions on them. And the architect was horrified. The client was even more horrified. To pay $6 million more of money he didn't have, a public building. What are you going to do? He said, they said, you, you know, you're going to have to build this wall. I haven't got the money. You're going to have to build it for two million something. So we thought, what's wrong? You know, these guys came in and they all looked at it and said, this is fine. Well, what was wrong was do not expect a contractor to take your design liability. Do not expect them to take that unless he fully understands what it is he's taking, right? Because he has four weeks to tender the project, during which time he's got to be absolutely sure, not only that he can build what he's building, but that the design that he's going to take responsibility for, now why is he taking responsibility for it, Yuma? Why is he taking responsibility for it? because there are no codes of practice about glass. Hmm. So the consulting engineers don't do glass. Who does it then? The industry does it. Blimey, it's just like the concrete and the steel industry in 1900. It's exactly the same. Do you want this one or this one? You come up with something new, great, but we're not doing it. We're doing this one. And there's a good reason for it, because they have such a little time to think about it, they're not going to take responsibility for something that's they don't understand. Even though it looked simple, there was complexities to it that you needed to think through. And it, you know, it just dawned on us, blimey, that's what's wrong. And we said, wait a minute, we'll you know, we understand it. We'll take design responsibility. It doesn't matter if there's a code of practice. We, we know how this works. We know about glass. We'll take design responsibility. We've got a local contractor from down the road in Philadelphia guy who, he looked at it, he said, I can't do that. He said, okay, let's go through it. Okay, get a piece of wire, hang it from a beam, put it down there, put a big weight on the bottom. Can you do that? Oh yeah, I can do that. Can you cut glass that size? I can do that. You know, can you clip it on the wires? Oh yeah, he said, I think I can do that. What's your problem? I've never done one like that before. 
but that's all right. Let's go through it. This, of course, he hadn't done one like that before because the industry had, you know, captured you know, the three firms. You know, Miro could do it. Pilkins, all these guys can do it. They can make stuff. You know, it's just they hedged the market because they got the designers and we'll do the fancy stuff. And by the way, we'll charge you four times what you would pay otherwise. And we're not going to look for economies because that doesn't do us any good. So that's very, very critical, and that's why we are valuable, okay? Not only because we bring the thing into being that needs to be brought into being, but we actually do it in a considered and efficient, financially efficient, or, or we have the capacity to do that, let's put it that way. If we take responsibility, now you have to think, where is the world going? Eh, responsibility, no thank you. And your insurance company will really applaud you if you do that. You know, the more caveats you put there, the more you can retreat from actually saying, yes, that was me and I did it and, and this is mine. Great, because then you can't be hung. And sometimes you do get hung, unfortunately, but you know, you've got to live, haven't you? If you don't, you'll retreat. And you know what? The design build contractors will pick it up like that. And you know what you'll get? Stagnant development in design. Ask the American washing machine makers. If you ever go to America and look at the washing machines that you get with the flats, they're about 40 years out of design date. You know, you look at the German one, you look at the American, you think, have I gone through a time warp? There's a lack of development sometimes in if you can get a safe market. Okay? So as designers, I think we've got an opportunity to push back on that because if you don't, you'll disappear. And so will architectural works disappear. It'll get harder and harder to do something if, if, if we're not able to take responsibility. And I, and, and I think it, it's important at every level. It's important to actually enjoy what you do, you know? I mean, if you don't do that, then it's not so much fun. I can tell you the first 20 years of being an engineer didn't feel like the last 10 when I did this stuff. This was exciting. This, I, I used to wonder why architects stayed awake at night when they had, you know, we didn't, go, we didn't stay awake at night. I went to the pub and went to bed. Because um, we had exams, you know, and there were questions. You had design decisions to make. You had to actually sweat it. You actually had to think and feel and go down and go up and you had no boundary. You know, we know the question's either this or that, right? It's either 20 newtons, you know, it's numbers. And the examiners love to, love, you know, it's really easy if all you've got to do is, oh, you got it right. With you guys, you've got to sit for, what are you trying to do, you know? So it's very different. And, you know, it's, it, it's really um, exciting to have it. I mean, I know it doesn't feel like it sometimes when you're having this light for a couple of months. But it's exciting. It's exciting to have to stay awake to think about something. And this was the first material that I actually, or this is the first time in my career that I actually would stay awake at night and think, oh my God, you know. Because you could sort of see the glass falling down and, you know, hitting someone in the head and you think, oh, what have I, for you know, maybe I've forgotten something. Um, but when you do that, then you get forced to think in ways about things that you hadn't thought about before. And I thought, crikey, that must be what those 19th century engineers felt like. You know, they were doing that stuff. They were doing, they didn't have anyone to say, yeah, that's the right number. They were building something and saying, oh, this is my best, best bet at it. You know, and if the Eiffel Tower fell down, that'd be a bit of a problem, you know. But I'm, I'm sure there were many, many examples of things which did fall down. Still do, mind you, but. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking now and just show you pictures, right? Because um, this is the development, anyway, from the beginning to the end. And if you've got any questions when you see the pictures, um, you can. Eva Jurekna's staircase, first one. Glass on acrylic. 25 mil glass, 15 mil acrylic. Lovely, simple solution. Glass breaks, acrylic works. She still does them like this. She likes it like this. Simple, it's cheap, limited in size, but 
it works well. I, designing the glass shell to see the details. So every detail has got to be considered. You can't hide it. It's all crafted. That's still there. It doesn't quite look like that anymore, but these glass planks in St. Martin's Lane, if you walk down St. Martin's Lane, are still there. They were clear, and you kind of, walking on glass, difficult if it's clear, okay? If you've got a cat and you've got a glass floor, you'll notice the cat will not walk on the glass floor. And they're usually quite intelligent. <laughs> Babies wouldn't do it now. They're intelligent too, just adults. <laughs> <laughs> but what you find through time is that the glass gets a patina, okay? Because people, now the fence went, first of all, and then people started trying to, as you walk past it now, it now looks like it's been sandblasted. It looks, looks quite nice, actually. And it still lets light down into the basement. Um, but it's still there, and that's sort of 89, 22, 23 years or something. Um, the Apple stairs were, I think, probably the point at which the glass became, when I could actually confidently say, I'll design you anything you like in glass, and I can guarantee that it could all break and it wouldn't fall down. It could all crack and it wouldn't fall down. And that was really a, a very big jump. And it's now become like what happened to concrete, right? Because concrete used to be like brittle. And so if you made a long slab of concrete, it would crack and you'd fall through it. And then some clever person said, well, what if you put a steel bar in there, right? And then you stand on it and it works. Now, this is exactly the process here. And it depends on the material that bonds the glass together. This is not one piece of glass. This is four pieces of glass. If you go to the Apple store in Regent Street, you'll see exactly the same detail. Steve Jobs is a product designer. <laughs> okay? He's designed it. So it gets repeated 300 times. So you, you can see this detail, and it's exactly the same one. And it's um, century glass material, which is uh, strong plastic, basically, sticky plastic. It's done in a, a kind of heat and pressure process. But when it's together, um, you can span a long way. We're doing a bridge just now that is uh, spanning about three and a half meters with just a big slab of glass. And it's fine. You can make it thicker and make it go further. Mm. And the Chinese will do an 18 meter long one for you if you like. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, the detailing is interesting. The other interesting thing about this material with the glass is that you can bond metal to it. Okay. And um, in here, the the fixings are actually uh, laminated into the glass in the layers and then you fix into the side. So you get a wee metal fitting called a puck. There might be a better picture of the puck. You can just about see the, you can see, see it there and then there you see it there, you see a bit better there. It looks like a double it's just a double image, but there's one, one puck semicircular about 50 mil across, and it comes inside the glass tread. And then you, you bolt through, well, you bolt that bit on first of all, and then you bolt through the glass wall with this other bolt into that piece, and that's what holds it up. Um, the tread, you need to not slip. You need to not look through it. 
and you need to be able to clean it, okay? And if you're sandblasting the surface, which you can do, which Eva does, you need to do it for a very rich client because you'll need a cleaner to clean it every day. If the dirt gets into the sandblasting, it won't look good after a while, so you end up. But everything has issues. You know, this finish here, which is a very nice finish, it's, it's actually done with acid etching. So it's probably environmentally disastrous, but <laughs> it gives a great finish. And it's slightly <laughs> sandblasted, so, so you can't see through it. Um, but it was a bit embarrassing, actually, because we did about five of these shops with this finish, and it really worked, you know, it was really nice. And uh, we did a big uh, staircase in Times Square called the Tickets Pavilion, where they used to sell the tickets. I don't know if anyone's been to New York recently, but there's a big red staircase. But if you watch that, uh, what's that song? What's her name? New York, you know, what's her name? Alicia Keys, yeah? And suddenly, suddenly I, I, I got my, my son, suddenly, I became different in his eyes. <laughs> oh, you want to know? Oh, really? Oh. Because <laughs> it was in the video, you know? Like she gets on the staircase at the end, she's playing the piano on this red staircase, which is a glass staircase. And it was the first time that we'd done something at that scale for, for other than the Apple stores. And when we developed the treads, the guy who made them, these are really beautiful, these treads. It's hard to get something done this elegant. And we found someone in New York who did it, and we thought, brilliant, you know, he's the guy. And so when we were doing the red stairs, we said, we want him to do the glass. And the client said, that's very well, but he wants to charge $500,000 for the glass, and Eckelt in Austria want to charge $220,000. We said, yeah, but Eckel's glass, not very nice. And the surface is, you know, it's frit. It's crap. So we fought and we fought and we tried to get DuPont to sponsor it and the whole thing, because, you know, it's a kind of prominent thing. Anyway, we lost. And at the same time, at the same time, they were doing uh, 59th Street Apple Store, which I'll show you a bit later, but it's... It's kind of a box, big glass box, and you come in off the street, straight on the staircase. Except when it's raining, you come in off the street, you go <laughs> And so they put carpets down when it's raining. So if you go into the glass staircase on 59th Street, go when it's sunny, okay? Otherwise, you have the carpet treads all the way down. Now, if I'd got away with getting that tread on tickets, I wouldn't be here now. Because we didn't think through what happens when it's wet. You know, we'd just done all these staircases and we thought it was perfect. We hadn't realized that they were all internal. They were all walking, walking distance away from wet feet. You had dry feet by the time you went up. And if we'd built tickets, with that glass, we would have had to replace the lot. <laughs> this is the, what I mean, right? What happens when it all breaks? It's unlikely, but you know, it can happen. Four sheets. I've seen two sheets break laminated. I've seen three sheets break laminated. Um, in service, not ours, but someone else's, because we would never have done a staircase that went from side to side without some internal other support, you know, because of that, because, you know, the laminates wouldn't hold it. You just go through it. But we did see other people's, you know, class people called us up and said there's a problem, and that's what had happened, you know, go straight through. But this doesn't go straight through. So this is the material, this is the reinforced concrete material that will have people doing things with glass if they can afford it, still expensive. Um, but otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to or wouldn't have felt happy to, secure enough to. People used to take risks with glass because it wasn't sometimes, somehow, another option. Waterloo Station, 1995, Pilkington's, overhead glass dropping onto the platform. 
two meter by one meter sheets. How did that happen? You have to think, you know, that's extraordinary really, but it's because there was a kind of confusion about safety glass, you know, um, toughen glass is safety glass, okay? Safe, it's actually called safety glass. It's not very safe if you're standing on it and it breaks into a thousand pieces, and it's not very safe if it's above your head and it breaks into a thousand pieces, because Galileo was right. It all keeps coming down at the same rate. <laughs> Bong. Um, earthquake zones as well, you know. You can, uh, you can build an earthquake zones with glass. Um, this goes back now to not Eva Jurekna, but Rick Matha. Eva Jurekna was very Baroque. You know, everything she did was fashioned in details. Rick Matha didn't want to see a single bit of metal anywhere. And we had a, a kind of one of those jumps. This was definitely one of the projects that made me um, sweat at night. And it was mostly to do with pride, actually, because you know I'd been in a meeting with Mather, and he always he's always he'd draw something, and or I he'd draw something, and I'd say, Rick, that's like you know half the size it should be. He says, Well, what size do you think it should be? And I said, Well, twice the size. <laughs> so, so well, it can be twice the size. It's got to be. So we'd always have this argument, you know, and he, he all he, and I realized he wanted to make it disappear. Really, he didn't want it to be there. And I had this, we'd started working with glass by this, and I had just, he had this wee tiny pole here. It was like 20 millimeters diameter or something, you know, that it was supposed to be a beam carrying the glass roof. And I just said, why don't we make it glass? He said, right, great, you know. And then I went and pulled the words back, you know, what did I say? <laughs> I thought, oh, shit, I've never done anything like this, you know. How, how do I do this? And, um, I went through this process, it's quite funny actually how, how you go through a process, but I started with like a single piece of beer. I was still muddled, you know, thinking tough and glass, yeah, that's the right thing, because that's tough, <laughs> that's strong. Um, and, and then I thought, yeah, but uh, you know, what, what happens if it breaks? And, and then I thought, well, I'll put a little uh, metal wire in the bottom, that, that, that will be a good solution, and that will strengthen it in tension somehow, and somehow it will hold it if it breaks. So then I thought, well, how do I keep a piece of wire there? You know, I can just, can't just put it there. And then I thought, well, I know, I'll cut a little groove in the bottom. And then I thought, wait a minute, who's going to cut a little groove like that? You know, how do you cut a little groove like that, that shape? Um, so I thought, oh, I don't know, that won't work. And then I thought, well, I know, I'll get three pieces of glass and I'll make the two outer ones longer and the inner one a little bit shorter, and then I'll stick the cable in the gap, and it'll be nicely held. Then there was the Eureka. What, why am I using a cable? You know, and that was the process. It was a nice kind of... Uh, and then, so it ended up being three... Uh, three pieces of glass sitting on three pieces of glass. And it made a little frame. But then I started to think, well, isn't that frame going to wobble? You know, when the beam buckles? And I had a real uh, soul searching. I mean, it's tiny, this project. It's like nothing. But the client is a high court judge. So it's a very big project, really. <laughs> and, um, I, I, and the other thing that is really important somehow about what, what we all do is knowing people who can do things. You know, there's no point in having a great idea if you can't find someone who will make it happily, willingly, and well. And there's a great contractor called Pat Carter. He's hilarious. He actually he has gone bankrupt more times than anyone else I know. And I mean by a lot. I mean, mostly I know people who maybe went bankrupt twice. 